a white couple who identify as black, they have no African-American DNA, say the child they're going to have soon is going to be born black. We'll see how that works out. Meanwhile, Huey Lewis and the News are coming up with a first album, their first album with new songs in 18 years. And Salad Works put out a press release saying there's a store or a restaurant that does salads. And you people liked it, but not quite enough to make it top 10 material. Those, those three stories were pretty awesome, but not awesome enough to make it into 1 through 10. So what stories are in that countdown? We will tell you in mere moments from the wrap-up show with me, Jay Cleveland Payne, brought to you by ThisIsTheConversation.com. This is a wrap-up show for the weekend ending January the 26th, 2019. And welcome to the show. As already stated, I'm Jay Cleveland Payne, and this is The Wrap-Up Show, which is brought to you by ThisIsTheConversation.com. That's a website that aggregates news from around the world in various sources. And why do we do that? Because I am a news junkie, and actually I'm a news producer. I work in news every single day, and I also get stuck on the things that are the important big stories, the top breaking news things that are always on the Chiron. But... There's always other things that I have to cover, things that seem to be more interesting, more enlightening, and actually more heartwarming. And because of that, I had a heart to share them with you and see what stories were the most conversational between the world, because this is a worldwide podcast, basically, to see which stories that reach out to you that you say are the top, not the ones that I believe will make the best stories, the stories that you engage with and you tell me that are really important. The key is engagement. So what you do to be engaged is simply follow the movement. Follow This Is A Conversation on its social media feeds. TH underscore conversation is where you find us on Twitter. And This Is A Conversation is how you find us on Facebook. Also find us that way on Instagram as well. But Instagram is not quite as interactive as you know. But you find if you go to Twitter or Facebook and look through your feed and see one of our stories and interact with it. It's simple. Just like it, love it, hate it. Share it, respond to it, do what you can to interact with it. The more interactions that a story gets, the higher it goes up in the score. And we give you, at the end of the week, a top 10 score, a 10 to 1, which stories are the most important. We also will give you a story we call the Almost Irrelevant Story of the Week, which sometimes is almost relevant. Sometimes it just has the luck of draw being very late into the draw. Today it's number 200, 200 separate different postings that we had distinct for the two um, social media accounts. And, of course, we'll round up the top 15, tell you about the stories that didn't quite make it into the top 10, maybe why, if we can figure it out, but some stories that were sort of big, but not quite big, big, if you understand what I mean. And if you don't, it doesn't matter because we're going to roll on with this thing anyway. We're going to count this thing down, Casey Kasem style, 10 to 1, with the stories that you believed were the top stories per what was out there on the Internet based on the postings and the times that we put out all week long. Or seven and a half days from Friday-ish to Friday-ish. This week's number 10 story has a headline that goes something like this. Tesla is slashing its workforce by 7%. Got this from CNN, at least our copies from CNN. Friday, January the 18th, the day it was posted. A few lines from the story from CNN Business on the dealing with the Teslas. Tesla has announced plans to reduce its full-time workforce by 7% as it works to increase Model 3 production and cut prices. CEO Elon Musk told workers about the job cuts Friday in a letter that Tesla posted online. The company will only retain the most crucial temps and contractors, Musk said. Musk wrote in a letter that Tesla is, quote, up against massive entrenched competitors, unquote, and must work, quote, much harder than other manufacturers to survive while building affordable, sustainable products, unquote. Another quote coming says, to the departing, thank you for everything you have done to advance our mission. I am deeply grateful for your contributions to Tesla. Tesla currently has about 45,000 employees, so about 3,150 people will be losing their jobs here. And the layoffs follow a surprise profit of $312 million for Tesla in the third quarter, driven by solid sales of Model 3. But Musk said Friday that unauthorized results, unaudited results, indicate Tesla will produce less profit in the fourth quarter. So that's what we're looking at right now for Tesla. It is uh, axing some of its workforce to bump up production of some of its Model 3s, which are a cheaper model so more people can actually afford them. If you're a Tesla person, this might mean something to you. If you are just a business person, this might mean something to you. If you're not in the business, don't particularly care about the electric cars, then maybe this one's a pass. We'll go on to the number nine story, and we'll see if that one's more engaging for you. And for this story, we go to The Hill, The Hill, The 
publication, not so much to Hill. But you'll get into it in a moment. The headline is, Four Women Found Guilty After Leaving Food and Water for Migrants in Arizona Desert. This story posted on Sunday, January the 20th. A bump of response, I mean, more responsive to you. You guys like this more by 3.59%. A few lines from the story we have from The Hill. A federal judge on Friday reportedly found four women guilty of misdemeanors after they allegedly, illegally entered a national wildlife refuge among the U.S.-Mexico border to leave water and food for migrants. According to the Arizona Republic, the four women were and were aid volunteers for no more deaths, an advocacy group dedicated to ending the death of migrant crossing deserts regions near the southern border. One of the volunteers of the group, Natalie Hoffman, was found guilty of three charges against her, including operating a vehicle inside the Cabaza Priata a National Wildlife Refuge, entering federally protected wilderness area with a permit and leaving behind gallons of water and bean cans. The charges reportedly stemmed from an August 2017 encounter with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Officer at the Wildlife Refuge. Three other co-defendants, Una Mokom, Madeline Hughes, and Zachia Okchonza McCormick, were reportedly passengers in the Hoffman's truck at the time and were also charged with entering federally protected area without a permit and leaving behind personal property. Each of the women faced up to six months in prison for the charges and a five dollar fine for being found guilty. So you can have your feelings on that one either way or in the middle if you want to, but that's a story came out and it came in a number nine story time spot this week. And as we say, these are put in by you. So we'll, do, we'll go more deeper into how that those happen a little bit later. Right now, let's move on to the number eight story. And this story posted on Friday, January the 18th, with a bump response of 16.34% from the nine story, is one of my favorites of the week for many, many reasons. And you can feel free to judge me as you want to. Headline, Pornhub reports spike in D.C. porn viewership during government shutdown. Let's get you a couple lines from this from Fox 5 in D.C. Pornhub is reporting a spike in traffic from its district during the government shutdown, according to its analysis team. The Pornhub Insights team said its statistics noticed an increase in porn viewership and a shift in the hours during which people are watching porn in D.C. According to Pornhub, viewership is more up more than 6% in the district compared to the pre-shutdown average. The data also compiled from... Uh, January the 7th through January the 11th, Pornhub said it picked those days because they would be the least impacted by the holiday season. Okay, picking data that should actually count, and I guess it really did count. As both Democrats and Republicans fall fail to come to a compromise on the under border security, 800,000 American workers have gone without a paycheck, shut down already the longest ever, entered its 27th day Thursday with no promising solutions in sight. And it goes on to give you more details about the actual shutdown. But Pornhub, because people watching the Internet and watching porn is their business, keeps up with analytics. And analytics said that because of the shutdown, apparently people have more spare time and they're using some of that time to watch more porn. From a story of porn to a story of supposedly scorn, we're going to move on to the story that is in the seventh spot this week. The headline is, New video complicates uproar over incident between student and Native American man. Posted this on Monday, January the 21st with a bumper response of 17.87% there. We get this from the Huffington Post. I will give you a quick rundown of some of the things that were in this article as the facts and the actual story continue to just evolve from, from this point even further. So we saw last week at a Right for Life rally a group of kids from a Catholic school who were wearing MAGA hats and MAGA gear uh, were seemingly in a video disrupting a older Af older um, Indian American man uh, who was a, um, a chief and a, a, and a uh, Vietnam vet with a standoff and just cheers and jeers. It turned into a big uproar on why these kids being so disrespectful to this man. And the story that we got initially was there was a confrontation between these students, these white students, and a group of black men that was getting kind of heated. And the Indian Native American man came in. They were beating drums as a part of an, an indigenous uh, tribe walk. They had their own walk going on. The kids were actually done with their walk and were waiting for buses. And they, the basically the medicine man and a few other people stepped in to kind of you know, it got diffused the situation, which turned into the picture of the kids smirking in one guy's face and a lot of yelling and screaming like kids would do. So that happened. 
Now we're getting new video with newer sides and more visions of what we're happening. And the more truer, although there's still many, many bits and pieces to this was, the kids were basically being heckled by a group of black Hebrew Israelites, a group of black people, black men, when they were calling them black Muslims, but they weren't Muslims, were heckling the group of white kids wearing the MAGA stuff because that's where it went. And it got a little heat. It got a little shouting back and forth. The kids were basically waiting for buses to get on buses to go back to wherever to head back to back home. And as we said, the um, the Native American man came in and tried to defuse the situation. However, it was not the uh, black Hebrews who basically charged into the situation and made fools of themselves in social media. It was a bunch of the white kids. And so now at this point, we know there is more people involved. Knows it is a bigger thing. We know that the kids weren't really thinking in the moment. It didn't quite do the right thing or at least the most immediately smart thing. And we put a lot of blame on the chaperones for not having enough sense to get the kids out of the way. We've heard from several of the kids involved, including the young man who was uh, standing in front of the most famous and with the, with the smirk. He called it just a smile. He said he had a right to be there. He asked for a chance to talk to uh, the the man in, in the picture who was drumming in his face as he was standing there. Uh, that man doesn't really want to talk to the kids, but wants a larger conversation. This thing gets really, really weird. And, of course, it's all under the, the big shadow of a weird government shutdown where 800,000 people are not working because of a wall. And, when, and, of course, when you're shouting at Native American, build us a wall to keep you out when, you know, they were kind of here first. This gets really, really silly, stupid, really, really fast. And that's what this whole situation has turned into. My girl Tommy Lauren is back in the news again, this time with a more or less beef. Well, well I'll let you decide. This is a story that is in the number six spot this week. It's a bumper response of two or 6.50 from the seven. Sunday, January 20th, the day it was posted, Cardi B and conservative commentator Tommy Lauren are taking shots at each other on Twitter over the government shutdown and the border wall. So that's essentially what happened. Tommy Lauren and Cardi B are taking shots at each other over Twitter over the government shutdown and the border wall in which Cardi B kind of got a little nasty and people sort of took that for a case that Cardi B wins the war. Not so much a long, battling, boiling Twitter beef. And in fact, I'm pretty sure Tommy Lauren is pretty much done with it because she can't really go too far. But uh, as the, it went back and forth, essentially Tommy went through and, um, and made the call out towards Cardi and Cardi sort of checked her pretty quickly with a tweet saying, leave me alone, I will dog walk you. And that pretty much... <laughs> it only went a little bit further, but that pretty much uh, did it from the beginning as they went back and forth with their thoughts. Tommy Lauren's thoughts, essentially known for being a, a insightful and incitative. One of those is, is a negative commentary uh, commentator for the right and Cardi B being an R.B. singer who, um, you know, may have seen uh, racism from a wholly different perspective than Ms. Lauren who, because of who they are. There wasn't much of a real beef. It was more entertaining, but it was just fun and funny to see this little thing pop over for about a couple days until we got back to more important business like trying to act, actually end the shutdown we have here in the States for the government. Let's move ahead to the next story, a story that really goes back to the seriousness of the world events going on. Headline is Maduro says La Venezuela is breaking relations with U.S., gives U.S. diplomats 72 hours to leave country. Wednesday, January 23rd is the date we posted that one, a bump response of 9.49% from the number six story. By the way, the number six story was the top story on Facebook. So you Facebookers love the Cardi B controversy with Tommy Lauren. That was a number. That was a top story on Facebook, and yet it's only in the number six spot. We'll go more and deeper into how those happened when we do some housekeeping in the second segment of the show. Now, going back to this one, uh, here's a few lines from the story. We pulled the copy from M or CNBC. Venezuela opposition leader Juan Guillo declared himself interim president on Wednesday, winning over the backing of, the wa of Washington and many Latin, uh, Latin American nations and prompting socialist Nicolas Maduro to break relations with the United States. Speaking to supporters outside the Miraflores Presidential Palace in Caracas, socialist leader Maduro said he would give the U.S. diplomatic personnel 72 hours to leave Venezuela, which is suffering from hyperinflationary economic collapse. 
U.S. President Donald Trump formally recognized Gudaro shortly after his announcement and praised his plan to hold elections. That was swiftly followed by similar statements from Canada and a slew of right-leaning Latin American governments, including Venezuela's neighbors Brazil and Colombia. The U.S. State Department said in a statement that it would not remove American diplomats because it did not recognize the Maduro regime as a government of Venezuela. Quote, the United States does not consider former President Nicolas Maduro to have the legal authority to break diplomatic relations with the United States or declare our diplomats persona non grata. So there you go. Uh, this is one of the weirdest things that happened in the news for our government this week because a lot of people praised Donald Trump for actually recognizing the new leader who, of course, basically declared himself it because we know that Maduro is not going to give up his, his status. In fact, he literally just said, I'm just going to you know, leave the world, which isn't quite working so well. So many weird things are going on in Central America and in Venezuela, particularly a nation that was essentially on par to be a maybe not by size wise, but economic wise with all the oil, all the money coming through it years ago uh, on the great main stage with uh, most of the G7, G8 types types type nations. It had the money. It just didn't have the infrastructure and maybe some of the, for lack of a better word, the class, the gravitas of a grander nation. Also was led by a bunch of fascists and wannabe communists. Now the nation is really not doing very well. It's very known. Many people that are coming from this area are part of the massive groups of caravans that um, the president is, you know, blaming Mexico for when there's actually other nations. And this is just one show that international relations is pretty slippery and never all that simple. Let's move on to our next story of the day, and it's one that's also very heartbreaking. It's a, it got a lot of very quick response uh, as it moved into the, the news cycle uh, late on Wednesday going through Thursday. And we were getting uh, different reports and more in the housekeeping in a bit. But this is one that happened. It was a breaking news story that we didn't actually post. But after the resolution essentially happened, we posted it still, and it still had enough juice to punch itself into the four spot this week. 4.64% jump from the five story Wednesday, January the 23rd, as we said, was when it was posted. This is the headline we posted. Shooting suspect surrenders to SWAT team at SunTrust Bank in Sebring. The updated headline from Florida Today is police say Zephron Xavier killed five before surrendering to SWAT team. Uh, so that's where we got it from Florida Today's website. It's a net site, so it looks a lot like USA Today. The last update we see listed is on January 24th at 9.30 a.m., so I'm going to read from the updated version of the story. Sebring shooting suspect Zeph- Zephyrin Xavier made his first appearance in court Thursday morning. Wearing a black and white striped prisoner uniform, Xavier spoke to 10th Judicial Circuit Court Judge Anthony Reitnow via monitor from the High Grounds County Jail. Retinar denied Xavier Bond on five counts of premeditated murder and appointed him a public defender. Following the judgment, a representative for the public defender's office claimed the office was denied access to Xavier while he was in police custody. Retinar and state prosecutors declined to debate the issue in the hearing. It is unclear if Xavier had a lawyer present during a questioning with authorities. As you know, there's a bank in Florida where the shooting happened, and this one is also a story that really escalated uh, to all sorts of level of weirdness after the fact. Xavier was uh, basically detailed by as from neighbors as being just a kind of a basic guy that no one could expect that this would happen to, all the way to his girlfriend saying that he basically wanted to go in there and kill everyone. He was so angry. This is a story that is going to definitely uh, rattle some cages and rattle some bells and spook some folks for a while. So as this develops, we will drop these stories into the conversation. If you want to keep com- ha- talking about them, having more conversation about them, make sure you respond to them in kind so we can get uh, the right response and get them into wherever they lie in the conversations going on normally. Our next story is what we describe as a super story, where we will combine the scores from two headlines to go together because they're very similar stories. This all happened in the same day, happening on the 22nd of of January, Tuesday, of course, and the bumper response from the total number is 3.25%. This story and the headline we're posting would have already been in the top top 10, and we'll talk about that in the housekeeping, but we added a second headline, a second stats, 
and we'll explain why it moved up from where it was to this spot. The three spot right now, U.S. singer Chris Brown released without charge in Paris after being questioned on suspicion of rape. We got the posting that we used was from the BBC, so I'll read a little bit from the BBC, the story they have there. This is the, the second story. I'll explain the first story, which is sort of obvious, though, a bit later. U.S. singer Chris Brown has been released without charge in Paris after being questioned on suspicion of rape, French police say. Investigation into the alleged incident is continuing, the Paris prosecutor's office said. The star and two other men were arrested on Monday after a 24-year-old woman alleged she was assaulted in a hotel in the city earlier this month. After his release, Brown took to social media to deny any wrongdoing. Here's some quotes. And here they go. I want to make it perfectly clear, clear this is false alongside a picture that said this bitch lying that was on instagram he had in all capitals i want to make it perfectly clear this is false before going on to say it was quote against my character and morals brown's lawyer rafael Chichai, a child i am totally butchered that said the r&b singer he energetically professed his innocence and intended to sue the defamation the two men arrested with brown identified by french media as a bodyguard and a friend has also reportedly been released the legend said is said to have occurred in a luxury Mandarin Oriental hotel back on the 15th of January. This story, of course, will develop. Uh, Brown already said he's going to sue. So we're going to see how far this thing goes or if it does go away. Chris Brown, a guy who can't really afford too much trouble, especially in that type of situation. And we'll see where it goes from there. It's the third story this week. So it obviously was pretty big to you. Let's move on to what is our number two story of the week. This story is the top Twitter story as well, and it is number two, so that tells you sort of the scope of the next one we'll get to for number one. But the basic details for this one is uh, it is uh, a bumper response of 2.29% from the three story. We posted this on Saturday, January 20th, and this is one that developed a bit before and after we got it posted. Former U.S. figure skater John Coughlin dies at 33. We got the copy from People online the headline from the updated story says u.s figure skater john coughlin dies of apparent suicide at 33 after being suspended from sport a few lines from this one for some context former u.s figure skater john coughlin died in kansas city missouri on friday according to his sister angela lauren he was 33 quote my wonderful strong amazing passionate brother john coughlin took his own life earlier today she wrote on facebook i have no words kansas city police department has not yet issued a police report, but Sergeant Jake Bacina confirmed to people that officers were dispatched to the 10,900 10, block of Washington Street on Friday at apparently 4.54 p.m. in response to apparent death by suicide. Bacina confirmed that the deceased was identified as John Coughlin of Kansas City. Coughlin was a two-time U.S. Paris champion and worked as a coach, TV commissary, and skater with U.S. Figure Skating and International Skating Union. He participated in two world championships, placing sixth in 2001, eighth in 2012. Now, this is where it's not in here. Well, actually, there's a big clip. I'll go to the next paragraph because it is some here. According to USA Today, on December 17th, Safe Sport, an organization that has exclusive jurisdiction over sexual misconduct in the Olympic loop, and investigates other abuse allegations across multiple sports, restricted Coughlin's eligibility to participate in figure skating pending final resolution of a matter presented to him. On January the 8th, Coughlin resigned from his post as U.S. brand manager for or John Wilson Blades, a skating blade retail company, USA Today reported. So what was being called a temporary suspension was basically thought of as being pulled away for some sort of sexual misconduct or sexual something. Nothing was really said yet, but because of that, it was so bad, so horrible that John Coughlin thought this was a time to end everything. We have way too many stories like this and way too many times to drop this information, but we feel it's never a bad time to remind people that suicide is an option that really, really should be taken off the table. And if you need someone to talk to, despite what everything is going on, the National Suicide Prevention Hotline is here for you here in the States. You can call them, 1-800-273-8255, 1-800-273-TALK. And that is, man, 24 hours a day, every day, everywhere. If you are wanting to do it online, you can check them out at suicidepreventionlifeline.org. 
There are plenty of resources, as you said, free, confidential, 24-7 to help you get off that metaphysical ledge and back into some semblance of what is going to be normalcy. If you've dealt with these sort of situations and these feelings, you know how hard it is to get yourself back into the reality that is there, not the reality that you're stuck in at the moment. So call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 800-273-8255. Visit them at suicidepreventionlifeline.org and talk to someone. If you want to talk to me, send us an email via here, and we'll talk if you want to as well. I've often talked about some of these stories we pop up that really do hit close to home, and this is one that hits close to home, although it's an old home. Back when I lived in Alabama, I lived near this town, and this is something that literally came out of nowhere, as they do, and a lot of people responded to that. So, like I said, this is not the top story in either Facebook or Twitter, but so much response on both platforms made it a big deal and nationally. In fact, I have a weather watcher friend who lives in this town. He's also a volunteer firefighter, which is why he's big into the weather and disasters who had to deal with the stuff. And it was amazing hearing his stories on this. Let's give you the stats for this story first. It is the number one story, of course, posted on Saturday, January 19th. He gets a bump response from the number two story of 15.69%. From the number 10 story, which is, of course, Tesla slashing his workforce by 7%, its bump was 111%. And from the almost irrelevant story this week, which is numbered at 200 on the dot, a bump response of 5,800. That's 5,800%. Here's the headline, followed by some lines from USA Today where we pulled the story. Tornado causes significant damages in downtown Wetumpka, Alabama. A tornado caused major damage to downtown Wetumpka, the city's mayor said Saturday, with several buildings on the ground after the intense storm passed through the area. One injured was reported at 4.30 p.m., said the mayor, Jerry White. The injury wasn't serious. The damage seems to be confirmed on the west side of the city, located about 15 miles northeast of Montgomery. First Baptist Church and First Presbyterian Church received major damage, Willis said. It's bad when you have a place as much as we love Wetumpka to see this devastation. We have worked so hard to get here and see it destroyed like this. This was a quote from Willis. Emergency crews from Millbank, Prattville, and Agaga Town County are offering assistance. Willis urged residents to stay out of the area and allow crews to work. As I said, one of my, um, one of my friends is a volunteer firefighter. Uh, there in the area, and he got a chance to do some some cleanup work and put some drone footage of of the of the thing. He put a before and after picture of one of the churches that got destroyed essentially, and these things really do hit home. Living in Arkansas, it's the same essential thing. A tornado just shows up whenever it feels like it, and in the middle of January, you know you're not really expecting something like this to happen. That's why the weather is such a big deal in these things. So our hearts and our prayers go out to people. Luckily, no one was seriously injured in this tornado. Uh, if you will, it's a fairly small area compared to other metropolitan areas. So not a lot of area was damaged. But the damage that was there was significant to the area, and the people are doing their best to clean up and move on. So if, you, if you're near the area, please feel free to do whatever you can to help them get themselves settled. And if you're not, if it's something that you're interested in, uh, you can always give to your local Red Cross. Uh, it will help for your local areas. And when the need comes from larger areas or areas outside of your region, they funnel resources and send them to where they need to go. So now that you know all that, you know all that. You know what the stories are from 10 to 1, top 10 stories for this week. And it's all done and said literally by you. Well, I say a little bit by posting them online. And then you say which ones are the most important. As we said, and I'm saying said a lot, 200 different distinct postings this week. And of that, those were the top 10 for the week. We will explain a little bit about the Chris Brown. It's a bit of a super story. So how that happened in the next segment. But if you want to make sure that your say is said, I'm saying say and said a lot today. Just simply follow us on social media, TH underscore conversation for Twitter. And this is a conversation for Facebook. You can follow us on Instagram as well at this is the conversation. But the interaction comes from the Facebook and the Twitter as the stories come through your feed. Like, love, hate, share, reply, laugh at, uh, do the little sad face, whatever it is that you think you want to react to it, react to it. 
Those reactions, those engagements give more weight to the stories. And at the end of the week, we put them together and compile them, do a little math here or there, and we give you a rating, a listing from one to wherever, as we said this week, all the way to 200 stories. And you just heard the top 10 right there. Coming up in just a second, we will have the housekeeping segment and talk about the almost relevant story of the week and sort of how it got there. Here from the Conversations wrap-up show, which is, comes out every single week with me, Jay Cleveland Payne, and this is for the week that happens to be ending on January the 26th, 2019. I had a recent experience with a gift card that was given to me, I don't know, like a year ago. A nice gift card, and I'm very thankful for having it, but because I am who I am and things just kind of get flipped around, I finally got around to recognizing it and getting it up, getting it updated and getting it registered so I could use it. It was a $50 gift card that is now a $20 gift card. That's really sad. But if you want to give a gift that will never lose value, the gift will not depreciate. They don't want to take your money. They want to give you a great experience. Here's a group that will take good care of you. They are Cloud9 Living. Now, you buy your gift cards, whether as an actual card, to send to someone or an e-gift card so they can use it in a certificate, and they'll offer free exchanges for whatever trip that you've paid for or not paid for in advance. No expiration dates on any of the the excursions you have. You just keep it up there, and, and you hold on to it till you get ready to use it, and easy returns if you don't want to use the card. If you don't want to use the card, they'll give you your money back, period. And that's not even talking about all the great experiences they have to offer. And there's so many, it's it's hard to name them. They offer popular experiences, including driving, flying, cruising, food and drink, camping, tours, and just overly, overly indulgent date nights. They have whatever it is you can dream of doing, you can probably figure it out that they will figure it out for you with Cloud9 Living. This is something I use fairly often for our vacations so that we can do something that will help make me happy and my wife happy. She wants to do more adventurous things. I want to do more chill things. We can have a great group thing, and then she has a great excursion like driving a NASCAR. I didn't want to drive a NASCAR. She drove a NASCAR. Me and my daughter went to the museum. It was perfect. You can get a great deal on a great excursion that will be great for you in cities across the world from Cloud9 Living. Visiting our website at thisisaconversation.com slash cloud9. That's num- that's word cloud and the numeral 9. Thisisaconversation.com slash cloud9. And get yourself in on this great deal that we have. We have an extra 10% off the deals if you go through our website. Trust me, you'll want to check this out. They have the best excursions for a great price. And just like I said, you buy someone the gift of experience, it never loses value. The money doesn't go away. They will hold on to it until it gets cashed, just like that, or until you cash it out. Either way, they'll take good care of you on the excursion or if it doesn't work out for you from Cloud9 Living. Let's take care of some housekeeping here. We're going to go ahead and keep with the theme of having three segments. I'm not sure we're going to get too many of the brackets in, and they may turn into a special feature to be done later. It's hard to schedule people and get things in. But we're going to talk about some of the issues we had going along the way with the story that we had with Chris Brown, the biggest issue in the housekeeping segment for the day. Now, we told you that Chris Brown's story, uh, the release from Paris after being investigated for suspicion of rape, it all happened on the last um, Tuesday. or So it happened within a span of a day where we posted a story about him being detained. And by the afternoon, at least by Art's time, we posted a story about him being released. The release story had the most engagement. It was enough to be in the sixth spot for the week by itself. We had to dig a little bit deeper to find the actual posting for the actual arrest. It was down to 63. Now, that means two things. One, the, the, the arrest wasn't quite as, as massive in the response as the actual release was, or basically people looking for Chris Brown finding out by that time they saw it. He was already released, so that one picked up the most steam. And number two, we are getting a lot more engagement in a lot more areas for the stories. The numbers uh, in the, although you see, I'll tell you about the difference in between the top and bottom 
uh, the mid range, the median numbers are staying pretty consistent and they're pretty, pretty high, if you if you will. So we thank you so much for being so engaged in everything. But the story on the rest, somewhere in the 60 range of actual responses being ranked. And remember, some of these some of these differences are pretty slim, just one or two points. Uh, at the top, it gets a bit a bit larger, but at, in the middle, some of these differences are just one or two points here or there going up and down. But the main story was big enough for six regardless. Add the story in the where it was. It bumped up from six to three. So it wasn't that massive of a bump, if you will, but it was significant enough to move it that many spots. And as we said this week, the top Twitter story was actually the number two story this week. The top Facebook story was the number six story this week. So a lot of love and a lot of responses went in and went in very quickly and pretty um, significantly for a while for the tornado story in Wetumpka, Alabama. So as I said, that's a something that's actually really personal to me because I lived in Montgomery. So I lived right outside of Wetumpka. And I know people who are living there right now Good friends who had to deal with, like I said, the the, the firefighters dealing with this and the cleanup right there. So if you got any love for Wetumpka or Alabama, despite Nick Saban, toss them their way right here. So let's go ahead and take care of the almost relevant story of the week. And this is one that got posted fairly early in the morning. So or as we're posted, as we're doing this on the Friday morning. So it didn't get a lot of chance to get a lot of love. And that's usually what happens. Sometimes some early Friday morning things are really, really big stories that blow up. And sometimes some are, are barely there. And this is one that I believe is kind of important, but it's um, barely there for the most part for the rankings. It also takes us back to Alabama, oddly enough, but not for not for any better reasons than the other one did. Here is your headline for this story. Felon serving life sentence escapes from Alabama prison. A few lines from the ABC store we posted. Authorities are searching for a convicted sex trafficker who escaped from Alabama prison this week. Corey Davis, 30, fled from the St. Clair Correctional Facility in Springville, Alabama on Wednesday, sparking a statewide search going to the Alabama Department of Corrections. Officers reported him missing from this cell after a security check around 8 p.m., the department said. Davis was assigned to a work detail inside the prison, and other inmates and staff said they saw him earlier in the day. The department is investigating how he managed to break out. This was posted to the ABC website at about 3 in the morning on Easter time on Friday, January 25th. So obviously not a lot of time to really deal with this one. It just so happened that this one did not pick up as much of the press. And we actually were a little behind in pulling up the stories this week. Uh, we got had a late start, so we got a little behind getting the stories calculated. So a few extra stories that normally wouldn't have got there, I got in today. But this was the one that did not make it into much of standing because that's the very bottom of the list at 200. Now, if you have any details on this person, I'm sure the Alabama authorities would love to talk to you. So make sure you talk about this. That's all we have on this one because it's just one of those things that happened. Didn't quite slip through the cracks, although we call it the almost relevant story of the week. It's only because the numbers didn't reach up to make it into the big time. Coming up next, we will talk about the rounding out of the top 15, stories 11 through 15. Stories ranked highly by you, but not quite highly enough to get into the main round. And no, I did not forget, we will have shout outs coming up in the next segment here. From the wrap up show from this is a conversation.com for the week ending January the 26th, 2019. Podcasting is fun. Yes, that is true, but podcasting is also frustrating and stressful, and sometimes pretty hard. So podcasting is something that's very simple to do with very little barrier to entry. If you have a microphone and a computer, if you have a phone, essentially, that you can talk into, you can do a podcast. But there's so much information out there and so hard to really get started and get into a groove when there's a lot of it is good, a lot of it's not so good, a lot of it's conflicting, a lot of it is a kind of it doesn't really matter, except you don't really know which one to do because you've never done it before. I'm offering up my little slice of confusing the issue, if you will, with a new podcast, because I've had too many of them already, 
called Podcast Pep Talks. And all they are are 60-second pep talks on your podcasting journey. Things to remind you that, yes, this is hard, and yes, not everyone's going to take the effort to do this. And maybe this part that people complain about isn't so much about the complaining, but it's about the complaining. Little nit noy, little small little pep talks to keep you going and remind you that I can even help you get your podcasting and your messaging set if you're doing that. It's very simple to find me. It's at my main website, jclevenpain.net. You can get there directly by going to jclevenpain.net slash podcast pep talk. No spaces, no dashes, just podcast pep talk. And you can get this new podcast. It's also available on the iTunes as well and the Google Plays as well. So you can look for it there as well. But the direct link, you can find information about podcast pep talks and how I can help you with your podcast or your pep talks at jclevenpain.net slash podcast pep talk. This week's edition of the Shoutouts is going to be pretty much all hail the usual suspects. People who are in the, the thing, including Perrine Doubt, AARP Goddess, T. Harrison, Brian Holland, Brown Skin Lady, Woke Patrol, Woke, Fake Woke Patrol, get that straight, and No Hogwash Books at Amazon Books. Thank you, guy. These are folks that popped in on Twitter with some responses throughout the week. Going to Facebook, a couple things that some people that are really good friends and some people that are also Usual suspects, including Carol Prime, Carl Prime, Mob Nano Slim, and We Come From Bad News um, a podcast as well. Some good friends of mine include Adele Carnes, Erstein Westlet, and Amari Nauman. Thank you so much for playing around, having some fun with me, and keeping this thing going along. Of course, anyone who wants to help to keep this thing going along can check out any of our sponsors at the main website, thisisaconversation.com, and just find one of them that will help you do great things and by turn, they'll help us do great things by keeping us on the air quotes air, if you will. It is time to round out the top 15 stories that were pretty big, but not quite big enough to make it into the range of the top 10. Uh, first off is Huey Lewis in the News prep first album in, in new songs in 18 years. That came out on Wednesday the 23rd. And this is big news because Huey Lewis has been going through some serious issues with his hearing lately. But now everything is at least settled enough so they can get some things done. So the news with Huey Lewis will be putting out a new album with fresh songs for Simon almost uh, two decades. And that's pretty amazing news on that end. This story was just straight up blonk bonkers. Um, and considering the source, it's also sort of bonkers that, that it's it's presented, but it's there. Uh, but it's, it's a real thing. A white couple who identify themselves as black say that their children will be born black and we got this from the blaze on tuesday january the 22nd so let's let's dig a little deeper in this in this story we all know about the whole rachel dolan's i think where she just uh she identified herself as black she uses black lightning blacking stuff for her skin or whatever and she has two children by black men therefore they are black children this is not the same situation these are Two people who just sort of identify, because I guess it's cool, <laughs> as black. Um, and yeah, they just, um, they're about to have a child. So how do they even come to this logic? Well, I'm not sure. Uh, essentially, they had surgeries and skin darkening treatments so that they uh, have darker skin. And they're just assuming that because they identify as black, then bam, they'll be black and it's also weird because um they're german which it makes it even weirder so just go to the blaze go to the website and look up the story and basically kind of read it for yourself going deep into it it's probably giving it more credit than it really deserves it's also just really 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 creepy to be honest so you can check that one out more deeper more deeper in deeper detail one of those is correct on its own now, let me back in. This one probably should have been. If it had made it into the top 10, I definitely would have did some um, of the housekeeping on this one. But Salad Works is apparently a chain of restaurants, a salad-centric franchise brand uh, that's expanding across some new states across the U.S. And because I follow PR from all over the place, especially locally for my actual job, the local airport PR person put out a tweet that put a link to this 
press release, which is basically all it was, a press release. And then later on, it turned into the actual article style looking things. But it was essentially a press release for SolidWorks. And it was apparently big enough to be in the rankings for the top 10. It actually was, was in middle range for a good period of time uh, in the raw rankings. So SolidWorks is a national chain that has salad-centric franchise brand, and they are extending across the nation. You're welcome, I guess. Wednesday, January 23rd, the date we actually posted that one. Now, Sunday, January the 20th, for the 14th story, Pacquiao Mayweather 2, it's not always about the money. With the big win Pacquiao had over Broner over the weekend, people are calling for another Pacquiao Mayweather fight. I'm not sure why they are. I'm not sure who these people really are, but apparently they want to see another Pacquiao Mayweather. Big money for both guys. And if you're into that type of stuff and watching these same guys go at it, since there's not much, there's not really a lot of flash in the combat sports in general. MMA is having some weird issues with UFC. Uh, it's in particular uh, changing networks for its main broadcast and going through some their own sort of doping issues and just personnel issues, whatever. So the combat sports in general not doing so great. So maybe people will pay for another Pacquiao Mayweather. And maybe they won't. Unfortunately, we end this week on a very tragic note with this story, and I'm going to read a little bit from it, um, unlike the other ones, and kind of get you detail because it doesn't do it justice just to give the headline. The headline is, 12-year-old girl dies in tragic snow fort collapse outside of Illinois Church. Monday, January 21st, a date that was posted. Here are, as I said, a few lines from this one uh, as we wrap it up for the day. That's the 15th story based on the week. From USA Today is where we got the actual copy. The 12 year old girl died while tunneling through a snowbank outside of her Illinois home, Illinois Church, on Sunday. Authorities were called to Rotham Church in Chicago suburb of Arlington Heights on Sunday afternoon, where the girl and her nine year old friend were found trapped in the snow. The girls had dug to tunnel through a large snowbank created by plows, Chicago WGN reports. Arlington Heights police said the makeshift fort collapsed in the girls while the families were attending a church service. The girls' families found them under the snow about an hour later. It is unknown how long the girls were trapped. It was about 14 degrees at the time. A 12 year old girl was now pronounced dead at less than two hours later. Chicago's Daily Herald reported her father said he is the pastor of the church where she was playing. Uh, ABC 7 Chicago reported. She was the youngest of three children and is remembered as a smart sixth grader with dreams of being a veterinarian. Nine-year-old was treated for hypothermia at a local hospital and expected to survive, according to Chicago Sun-Times. Police said in a statement that it was a, quote, tragic accident. And this is, you know, this is a really, it's, it's hard to even wrap this thing up. It's just a really sad, tragic th accident, as they said. Not really much you can go into that one. We want to put our hearts and thoughts and prayers into the families who are dealing with this, especially the family uh, losing a 12-year-old doing something just as simple as just having fun and playing in the snow. And unfortunately, we are wrapping up this week on such a little note. I wish we weren't. Normally, these stories are pretty uh, on the silly side, but this is one that made it into the range, and we, so we reported it. It was big enough for you guys to care that much about it, and it's a pretty big story, so I'm glad that you did care. If you care about what we do here for the conversation, it's very simple. Tell some people, tell your family, tell your friends, tell your mortal enemies exactly what we do here every single week. We count down the top 10 stories that everybody says are the ones that are most important. And if you have random people just walk up to you in the street and say, do you have a way for me to see what are the best stories in the news that aren't just stuck in a Chiron? Grab their phones, subscribe them to the podcast, hand it back to them. And trust me, they will thank you profusely for those things. In the meantime, Make sure you're actually subscribed to us as well, because if you're not subscribed, you may miss out an episode. If you're not following us on the social media, then you're missing out on all the fun. You don't get a chance to vote. So, vote. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook, and as you interact with the actual stories, they go up in the rankings. Facebook, it's This is the Conversation, and make sure we're labeled so we can be first in your feed and not just ignore it. We, we, we don't like that. It makes us sad. Twitter, it's TH underscore Conversation. And you just like, love, hate, share, reply, and do what you can to respond to the, to the actual posting that work that way. 
Instagram we're on at This Is The Conversation as well, not as interactive. And of course, our main website, this is the conversation.com. I am Jay Cleveland Payne. I'm actually a actual news producer who does this for a living and somehow stumbles through the stories every week in a podcast. Thank you so much for joining us for the time today. And we will talk to you next week for another great edition of the stories that you tell us are the biggest ones out there. From this is the conversation.com and the wrap up show. <laughs> <laughs>